everyone. I am Daniela Bleichmer. I am a professor of art history and history at USC and the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities. Thank you so much for joining us for one of our book chats. This is a new series that we started this year where we invite a colleague at USC who has recently published a new book to be in conversation with uh, experts of uh, her choice uh, and with all of you. Um, we keep this very informal. We have just one hour together. Um, so today um, we are welcoming, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Lisa Vest, who is the author of Avangarda, Tradition and Modernity in Postwar Polish Music, published by the University of California Press in 2020. And she is joined in conversation by Joy Calico, who is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Musicology and Professor of German Studies at Vanderbilt University, and Peter Schmelz, who is a Professor of Musicology at Arizona State University. Their conversation will be moderated by uh, my colleague Paul Lerner of the History Department at USC and Director of the Max Cade Institute. Um, we ask that everyone mute themselves, please, while uh, we uh, begin with the conversation. So Paul will moderate, uh, uh, Joy and Peter will be in conversation with Lisa for about 25 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions from everyone. If at all possible, we do ask that you turn on your camera. Uh, we find that it makes a difference to see everyone. Uh, who is here, it does create a sense of community. Um, and with that, uh, on to Paul. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, I'm just really delighted to present, um, to introduce Lisa um, Cooper Vest, and I'm going to turn things over to her in just two seconds, but um, I'm, as I've told her now, I think five times, I'm, I'm a historian and I'm really, not, I'm, I'm, I came into this not, let me put it this way, everything I know about Polish music, I, is, it comes from Lisa's book. Um, but as a historian, I found that this book really spoke to me and it, it um, you know, raises all kinds of interesting questions and, 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 and presents really fascinating insights about the working of time and kind of sort of questions of the backwardness and, and, and future, futurity and, and, and how the avant-garde is situated in this particular cultural moment. So I'm, I'm really excited um, to turn things over to Lisa so she can begin the discussion. Hi all, it's so nice to see all of you. Thank you for joining today. I see colleagues and students from USC. I see colleagues from around the country and I see colleagues from Poland. Hello, so good to see all of you. Um, I, uh, and thank you for Dan Daniela for inviting me to take part in these uh, book chats. I'm so excited to speak to you about my book. I've been a long time lover of uh, Polish contemporary music. Um, actually the first time I ever heard a, a Polish avant-garde piece, what, I was an 18 year old student at a liberal arts college in Arkansas in a music appreciation course. And I heard uh, Krzysztof Penderecki's Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima. And I was struck immediately by the affect of that piece. Uh, it's very difficult the first time you hear that piece to have an ambivalent reaction to it, right? It's uh, pure sound kind of hitting you uh, square in the face. And I, even at that time, I noticed the way it divided people. It was, it was not possible to be ambivalent about this piece. You had a strong emotional, almost bodily re reaction to it. And so I, I'd say that my fascination began there. And I took that interest of, in Polish music with me to my graduate studies where I was very much influenced by uh, the great work being done in Cold War studies in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, some of it by Peter and Joy, our uh, guests joining us here today. And um, I, I developed a project uh, kind of focused around the question initially of how. I was interested in, in how Polish composers were navigating and negotiating the relationship with the state um, in order to create this um, truly unique and exciting music. Um, I was influenced by great work being published by uh, scholars like Lisa Jakelski and Cindy Bylander on the Warsaw Autumn International Festival of Contemporary Music, which began in 1956 and is still today a major site for contemporary music making. And uh, uh, David Tompkins on the Polish Composers Union, 
Um, but as I began to dig into the archival sources, especially related to the period after the Polish Revolution of 1956, I discovered that the question how wasn't really the right question, um, in part because I had gone into this expecting a sort of embattled relationship between uh, the state and composers. But actually, I mean, certainly in terms of organizing institutional performances and publishing and navigating public life, that could be the case. But when it came to the sound of music, the aesthetics of music, the state didn't have a lot to say in Poland after 1956. There wasn't a lot of managing of sound. Um, and in fact, when I really took a step back and started asking new questions, um, I discovered that um, everyone in the cultural field, I'm talking um, composers, intellectuals, uh, audiences, musicians, uh, and even, yes, the, the state officials were partaking in um, shared broad discourses that sort of uh, hung together around certain kinds of uh, big themes. So in essence, I kind of switched my focus from how to why. Why uh, were all of these Polish composers kind of drawn to this interest in sound and affect, creating communication with audiences? And why were all of these different people able to participate and find consensus, able to work together through these big themes? Um, and how, why did this music get attached to the idea of uh, futurity and progress? So the sort of big themes that I noticed as I worked through all of this discourse, so in the, in the press, in the uh, archives, both personal, institutional, and state archives, uh, I, what I really discovered were the presence of uh, some, some big themes around which everyone, interlocking themes around which everyone was coalescing. And those were uh, the theme of the Polish nation, um, the experience of the nation, both stretching back into the past and the traumas that the nation had undergone throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, and then again in the 20th century, and then imagining a path forward for the nation moving into the future. Uh, relatedly, uh, this again, this question of aesthetics, what does music do? What is its function? What, how does it create connection with audiences? And how does it relate to this idea of Polishness? How do we sound Polish? Um, and then finally, an overarching theme for the whole book became the theme of time. Um, I found all of the, the cultural actors in my book, uh, whether they were political or cultural or, uh, or sort of outside of those realms, uh, were talking constantly about time, about how Poland was related to modernity or displaced from, mod from modernity in time. So there's this really um, concern with time that I used to structure the book. Uh, each chapter is sort of focused around a Polish word for time or for movement in time, as I sort of tried to think about how Poles were imagining themselves um, within a kind of idiosyncratic uh, time experience, um, both connected back to the past and moving forward in time. Uh, out of this concern for backwardness, I found that artists and institutions found real agency and energy in discussing uh, how, to, how to catch up, how to move forward in time. Um, and there was an ability to come to consensus even for individuals who did not share uh, political convictions uh, in this particular moment. Of course, if you really started to think about the future that they were imagining, sometimes though there was great divergence in what they imagined this progress would lead to, or who they thought was at fault, what they thought was at fault for the displacement or the backwardness. But if you focused on the journey, the, the, the notion of progress, there was a great kind of op opportunity for consensus that allowed people to work together um, and to create uh, this really exciting uh, musical world. Uh, because of these sort of unique travelings of the idea of progress and avant-gardism, the, the Polish avant-garde, I argue, doesn't uh, necessarily line up with what we, what we think of as an avant-garde necessarily, because it has taken on all these meanings over as it stretches over time. Um, for instance, uh, it's, a, it's an avant-garde engaged with tradition. It's an avant-garde that is invested in genius, in creative genius, and uh, with the kind of creating of transcendence and communication, which are not necessarily characteristics we associate with avant-gardism more generally. So this is why I retained the Polish word avant-garde in my title to kind of highlight that specificity. And then finally, I'll say that uh, as I worked more on this project, uh, the, ironically, the less it became a Cold War project, the more I recognized that these narratives uh, uh, stretched across, there was great continuity stretching from the 60s back even across the, the Stalinist years of socialist realism, the disruption and trauma of the war, and back into the interwar years, maybe even you could argue uh, further back than that. So 
uh, kind of stepping away from that periodicity of the Cold War in order to embrace um, the national story that happens here through the music and the, the work that music in Poland was doing in this moment. And then I'll leave it there. Thanks, Paul. Wow, thank you. That was um, that, that very packed, <laughs> um, very suggestive presentation. Thank you so much. And I, I, I think my, I'm not sure if it's fair to ask you this, but um, because your story is very much, I mean, I, I, I got that sense from the book that you kind of started, you were, the, the initial provocation may have come from an interest in the Cold War and the kind of cultural currents and possibilities of the Cold War period, um, but it's very much a Polish story. So I was wondering to what extent you see any kinds of parallels or if there even, I, I don't re recall much in the way of connections between other um, Eastern Bloc um, musical developments, so I'm, I'm, which in the visual arts is actually is, is happening very much um, between Czech and Hungarian and Polish um, artists and so forth. So I'm wondering, you know, how is, are there pieces of this story that can kind of come beyond, go beyond the Polish context and are, are to what extent are kind of inter-regional connections and influence is important as well. Sure, I mean, I think that um, there is enormous sort of transnational resonance here uh, as, as other nations are, are similarly kind of um, explore, exploring the, the tension between the national and the supranational uh, uh, in this moment of, of uh, Cold War division, as well as uh, thinking about the ways that various ideologies shaped people's experience and um, uh, uh, connection to, or sense of uh, mission, I guess, in the 20th century, and sense of modernity too, like what, what is modernity? And um, I'm thinking about work like Catherine Verdery's work on um, Romania, it was enormously uh, uh, important for me, thinking about um, nationalism as it relates to socialism. Um, and uh, certainly I would put my work in conversation with uh, the work that Daniel, Daniel Foster Luzier has done in Hungary. Uh, of course, the work that Joy and uh, Peter have done. So th this this isn't this the 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 tension or the the play between national and supranational is definitely not just specific to Poland, um, and it's not even specific to the Eastern Bloc. For instance, Phil Gentry's recent book on the United States and American identity after World War II similarly argues that for most Americans, the Cold War was a domestic experience and not a, not a, a grand geopolitical um, uh, one. So I'd say that Poland is in, in, in good company here and thinking about uh, the, the national in relationship to the geopolitical. And I would also say Lisa Dukelski's work on the transnational connections achieved through the Warsaw Autumn Festival is enormously important here for thinking about how the transnational um, functions in relation to the national, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And I mean, do, do you think Polish composers were, did they enjoy, kind of, a higher degree of independence from it because it seems like they did have a lot of room to work uh, that they were not so hemmed in by socialist realism or these other sort of strictures that the kind of stalinist regime would be imposing on the aesthetic output so i'm just, is is i mean is it is there kind of more freedom to experiment and kind of pave their own way in this case so i argue in my book that uh even during the height of socialist realism in the um, early 1950s, there were spaces like it was it was it was much more controlled. Uh, the, the, the state did have a lot to say about musical sound, for instance, in the early 1950s. Um, so uh, it was much more constrained, but there were still, I, I argued, sort of spaces for artists to um, retain and argue for, even very subtly, the, the, the relevance of high art music or of elite culture, they would say, um, of artists to sort of lead the way moving forward. And, and I think that that line sort of remains unbroken, even, even through the socialist realist period. Even people that, if you read their work, um, you might initially, in a quick, a quick reading, uh, believe it to be sort of doctrinaire statement of socialist realist aesthetics. But if you really dig in, you start seeing like little pockets where those people are protecting the, the role or the value of the 
artist in making um, uh, uh, creative choices. Now, those choices were a lot more constrained in certain places, uh, certain areas, like the, the symphony, for instance, had a lot of prestige value for um, uh, in, in the larger, broader Soviet sphere. And so to write a symphony was um, to open oneself up to a lot of uh, input a lot of control, but there were uh, spaces through chamber music, for instance, and through other kinds of cultural activity to maintain um, spaces for learning and for creativity. Also, I mean, there's the point that these Polish avant-garde post-war composers, the, the post-war generation, their, their knowledge had to come from somewhere, right? They didn't just spring fully formed in 1960 out of nowhere. So there were pockets of people sharing information, sharing scores, sharing, uh, coming together privately to um, speak about and learn about uh, uh, contemporary music. So there were ways uh, even under the, in the, the most sort of repressive rigid moments of the fifties to, to maintain this, this uh, value for experiment and newness. But uh, after 1956, the rhetoric of decentralization really uh, created a lot of freedom for Polish composers uh, to, to move freely, both nationally and sometimes also internationally. There were, they were traveling to Darmstadt. They were traveling to um, uh, the United States. They were, they were traveling uh, and making international connections. Let, let me ask um, one more question for now, if I may, and then maybe we can open that up to Peter and Joy and see if they'd like to come in. Um, I'm, you deal with this a bit in the book, and I'm, I find it very intriguing the kind of um, the you know where the Holocaust sits in 20th century Poland in kind of narratives of the past, and in particular in music kind of broken musical uh, careers and and and. Um, livelihoods and so forth. And I'm just, I'm kind of wondering if you could speak a little bit about where, you know, that very traumatic, but I think also kind of tabooed past sits in your treatment of, you know, futurity and, and the kind of the, the position of the avant-garde. Well, thank you for that question. In some ways, that was a question that I didn't really have a chance to dig into as much in this book, um, in part because there are, uh, I didn't want to uh, I say that there are other scholars doing that work and I wanted to remain sort of in conversation with them without kind of planting flags. But uh, um, one thing that I would say is that the, the, the presence of the Holocaust in particular can be felt in a lot of different ways uh, through this uh, narrative. Um, even when people are not talking about it explicitly, it's often there. Um, for instance, uh, the, the, mm, I'm thinking about Oh, my discussion about uh, dodecophony as a, a, a kind of point of, of anxiousness in Polish discourse as a, a missing signifier of musical uh, uh, modernity. But of course, there had been a Polish artist who was engaged with uh, dodecophony before the war, and that was Józef Koffler, um, who uh, was murdered during the uh, Second World War. And his absence becomes, in some ways, part of this, this anxiety of, uh, of missingness. Um, also, the, 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 the symphony of Tursky, the, the Olympic symphony, that is the big subject of discussion at the Waguf uh, uh, conference in 1949, is meant to kind of tell the story of the, the Second World War and of the Holocaust. And you can feel a lot of anxiety coming from the people who are evaluating that piece um, as, as not sure how it sits in relationship to socialist realism. Um, and it eventually, it, it, I mean, it, it sort of becomes the exemplar of what socialist realism isn't. Um, in, in some ways, that piece becomes uh, emblematic. And so that's, that's interesting too. And I'll point out that another really important avant-garde piece that I don't discuss in this book is uh, uh, Penderecki's uh, Brigada Śmierci, the, the radio opera um, uh, uh, about the, uh, which, which tells, uh, which is focused on narratives of uh, the, the Holocaust um, married to electronic music developed in the, um, the electronic radio studio and responses to that piece were also very troubled uh, when it was first premiered. So uh, in some ways you can find it, the, the, the trauma of the Holocaust. And if you dig into the archives, you really feel it in terms of um, Brak. When, when I, I talk about Brak, the, the focus on lack in uh, Polish discourse about backwardness, um, there's a sense of lacking people, uh, lacking uh, 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 institutions, things that had existed before the war and things that did not exist after the war. And certainly the Holocaust is part of that narrative. Thank you, that's really fascinating. Um, Peter, Joy, do you wanna come in now? Either one of you. I have, I have a question if that's okay. 
Hi, Peter. Hi. I, I just want to say, first of all, that I found the book to be um, really in, elegantly constructed and elegantly argued. And I just want to say congratulations. Uh, it, it's a real achievement. And especially, I mean, I think it should be stated that you, you finished this during the pandemic, yes? I did, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, having done, finished a book last year myself, it's not, it was not pleasant for me. So I hope <laughs> it went a little more easily for you. I mean, you don't see any traces of it in the book. So, um, well, thank you. I, I also to want credit. to say thank you to some of my colleagues and friends, and even especially colleagues in Poland who helped me with uh, last minute permissions and such, uh, which was really tricky in this last year. So, thank you to them. So obviously, I've been thinking a lot about the Soviet Union in relationship to what you're arguing. Um, and I have so many thoughts, and I'm going to try to, um, I guess, boil them down to something that is digestible. <laughs> I mean, the main thing, what I found really interesting about the book was the emphasis on time. Uh, and I really love this sentence in the conclusion where you said that progress, progress was the motivation and the engine and the destination. And I thought that was just like fantastic. And I'm going to use it in classes and probably quote it many times in the future. Um, but I found that to be so different from my experience looking at what was happening in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, and especially in Ukraine, which I've been focusing on more recently, um, where the buzzword that came to my mind as I was trying to think of equivalence was um, the word sovereignist, uh, the idea of contemporaneity or modernism. Uh, and I was, I'm wondering, is there a, a similar word in Polish that appeared? Because otherwise, in the Soviet Union, the, the level of discourse was not as robust and was not as sophisticated as it seems to have been in Poland about new music and about the avant-garde. Um, and it was more about younger composers were trying to be present. They were trying to be writing, they were trying to write a kind of music that reflected the reality around them, right? The space age, uh, new technology. Um, and it wasn't so much about the future as just being in the now. And I'm just curious as, as to whether um, you had any inclination of how the Polish uh, milieu was responding to, to that discourse or whether that was completely separate from what you're uh, writing about. Thank you. I mean, I think that uh, the word that uh, immediately comes to mind when you raise this question is uh, which I actually struggled with translating into English. Uh, I, I wanted to translate it as modernness, but I was uh, 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 convinced to uh, reframe it as modernity or uh, because it, there was a sense that modernness felt too too weird uh, and spolczesność is not a weird word in Polish. So it kind of brought a weirdness that wasn't there, but but spolczesność was this kind of focus on, on contemporaneity, uh, like uh, read, like well, I say many times throughout this book that the now, the new didn't always map onto the chronological uh, uh, next, right? It wasn't always kind of mapped onto a, a sense of chronology, but spolczesność did link to the, the contemporary moment, the sense of, of nowness. Um, and some artists use that word more than some of the other language. Um, and the, the sort of one of the main people that uh, I associate with Spul uh, Spulczesność is, is Bogusław Schaefer in my book as this figure who uh, really wanted to um, engage with uh, innovation as the, the foundation of, um, of futurity in, in creating this, this is the, he did not want to engage with the past or, or kind of imagine this flexible modernity that, income, that, that layered past on top of now on top of future, but instead wanted to rigorously move uh, into the, 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 pre the, the future moment. And so I think there was a, a, a world in which that discussion was happening, especially in, um, he, he began to connect more with the worlds of avant-garde theater, for instance, in uh, Krakow, especially this kind of feeling about um, futurity and the connection to um, the now. I, I do think that discourses of modernization also often linked to the now in, in certain, I talk about modernization as, as something that, that was uh, focused on building institutions, um, kind of filling gaps, and that often also uh, intersected with ideas of, of um, coming up into the present moment and inhabiting that present moment, if that makes sense. But um, it was never the only language of, uh, of uh, modernity available. It was just sort of one possible way of thinking about it. That's helpful. Can I just one, one quick follow up? Um, the thing, I mean, I've, I've known about the Polish influence on the Soviet Union on, on younger Soviet composers. I mean, it's so strong. Uh, and just it's been interesting to me to read your book because uh, Schaefer has come up again and again among the composers in Kiev. He was such an influence on them, particularly at the end of the 60s. Um, and this idea of backwardness, 
I mean, did did the Polish composers realize that they were ahead of the of the Soviets? That the Soviets thought of them as like the Soviets thought that they had to catch up with what was happening in Poland? Were they aware of that positioning? Like, did they know that they were sort of winning that race if they were casting it as a race? I think yes. I would say uh, yes. They were very aware uh, of of where they sat uh, in this sort of liminal space between uh, Western countries and the Soviet Union, and they were um, kind of working within that space um, uh, as as a. Uh, I, I think in some ways the the language of backwardness became a motivator to keep moving, keep uh, keep pressing, and not to become kind of um, comfortable and and uh, uh, to think, aha, we we've got it, we're we're, we're set. Um, but they were very aware of uh, their relationship to uh, uh, the Soviet East, especially through things like the, the, the Warsaw Autumn Festival, right? When people came and performed music that was so clearly existing in a different time uh, uh, space than the music that they were hearing from the West. And then their music sort of uh, moved between those uh, two spaces in certain kinds of ways or signaled uh, a clear, uh, defined uh, relationship to the West, as uh, Schaefer's music often does. Um, Schaefer is an interesting character in that um, in the I, I see him as being an enormously important pedagogue. I mean, his work, his publications in pedagogy of music, um, even the book that I discuss in my uh, book that actually had the cover, the same cover as, of my book, uh, his. Uh, uh, sort of focus on it was sort of a manual for contemporary composition. He was very much focused on helping others. And I think because of that, he probably was well known. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that he was influential in Kiev because he um, uh, just taught so many students, so many students coming to him and working with him. So um, uh, I think that that layer of his work deserves more uh, attention, more thinking. Um, as he kind of moves beyond his enfant terrible um, uh, persona and instead takes on a different kind of role. Thanks, that's helpful. I'll jump in here if I can. Um, I left twice, I got booted. I thought the biggest problem we would have would be my puppy running amok, but apparently it's my internet. I'm sorry, I will try to stay online. Uh, Lisa, I want to echo what Peter said about this being a, a really major achievement. Congratulations to you on pulling together a really sophisticated reading of um, discourse analysis in a very complicated, across a complicated stretch of time. So I was looking at the, the keywords in your chapters and thinking, you know, if I were going to do a 3D model of this time space continuum, like what does this tell me? So I have backward lack, dissemination, lag, modernity, avant-garde, which would be forward or advanced, backward and forward. So it's this constant push-pull, it's like Dr. Seuss, like this push me, pull me thing that's happening that is uh, this constant tension which ends up being really productive in the Polish environment in ways that I would say uh, absolutely do not <laughs> play out in East Germany in this, up through the 1950s at least. Um, that it's, it's a very different environment. But I was um, really struck by, for example, the importance of, because I think the stereotype of Polish avant-garde is extremely forward-looking. I think that's what I would, if you asked me, that's what I would say. And for you to bring back in the importance of the past, it makes me think, oh, you know, the very earliest years in the GDR, this is what someone like Eisler was doing, right? Like writing these folk songs you know, the, getting into the idea of creating a tradition for a totally illegitimate state was a really important part of like backfilling the story. But it takes a lot longer for them to get into the business of either rhetorically or actually musically doing something that is more forward looking. So um, I'd be interested to hear how your people situate, I mean, I mean, I have an idea that they, you know, they think poor East Germany, they're so backwards. But do they, um, the only case study I know about was when the East Germans were at the Warsaw, Warsaw Autumn Festival in 1958. Is there any kind of ongoing way they think of themselves in relation to East Germany in this period? Or do they just can't be bothered, probably? I, I get the sense that the East Germans often made themselves felt, especially at Warsaw Autumn, as kind of the, the 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 irritant sort of like the the reminder that they that they had moved away from the socialist realist ideal i mean the 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 material from uh, uh rebling is particular i mean like it's just so uh grumpy and and um uh like gets mad at them for even uh calling socialist realism soft surreal uh, soft realism like like get, gets mad at them for the language they're using to to describe it um so uh, I get the sense that the 
the the East Germans were always kind of felt to be this weird um, uh, irritant because they were, of course, um, uh, German. So uh, they were connected to this Western tradition that uh, uh, for, for a long time had been part of this kind of um, thinking about Western musical tradition. And yet it felt like they were more um, um, uh, more determined to be doctrinaire uh, uh, yeah. the Soviets than the Soviets were. Um, so I think that there was this sort of confusion and frustration with the East Germans. Um, and and uh, I, I guess I think they, they had kind of been um, mostly annoyed with them until this rebelling thing really uh, introduced a real problem because then um, in raising this alarm about uh, the Polish avant-garde not being avant-garde, uh, sorry, sorry the, the Polish composers being um, dangerously modernistic, um, then suddenly brought the Soviets in to, to see what was going on and, and, and they had to deal with that. But I think that um, your, your comment reminds me of uh, sort of this, this point that, that in, in the Polish musical world, uh, stretching back to the interwar period, um, engaging with the past didn't necessarily mean engaging with uh, folk music, for instance. Uh, it, 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 it meant all of these different kinds of things. Uh, it meant uh, there, through, through the lens of Szymanowski, for instance, it meant synthesis, engaging synthesis between Polishness and a sort of universal uh, uh, art music ideal. Um, and Szymanowski also had these kind of engagements with uh, texture and timbre and, and um, uh, the, the relationship between the horizontal and the vertical that becomes really important in Polish avant-garde music. So signaling the past um, could be done in all these different ways that didn't, that kind of avoided the, 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 the folk, which became kind of dangerously too close to uh, socialist realism, especially in the 50s, there was this kind of desire to push back against um, the folk, like Ludoswowski says, okay, well, the concerto for orchestra had some folk music in it. I'm done with that now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm moving on in a, in a new direction. But still, I, I, as I argue, the, the, the funeral music um, still engages with the past and charts a way forward, but kind of scoots away from um, certain modes of pastness that were too suspiciously linked, uh, linked to socialist realism and um, to things that other artists in the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc were still doing. Yeah, that's, it's a really sophisticated discourse analysis. So uh, thank you for making sense of so many different threads. That's it's really, it's really impressive. I had a question for you if, if we have time. Do we have time for me to ask a question? Okay, I had a question for you about um, the artist intellectual class and how this operates. Um, I mean, I know conceptually what we mean, but how this operates in this space as a sort of, as a, class unit, if you will. I mean, I understand that because in the third chapter, you talk about how we have these two institutions that had to navigate, okay, they have to negotiate both promoting and supporting elite interests and also, you know, hoping to bring up the folk in the radio studio and the journal. It seems like the festival is doing a different thing. Um, but is there artist intellectual as a class? Is this a, is this a concept they talk about or is this the way you're able to bring all this together? The, the word that often gets used is elite in, in the Polish uh, discourse. And I didn't want to continually use the word elite because also elite just has a lot of uh, resonances in English that I think weren't quite getting at what was being done through that discourse. So I guess I use a sort of artist intellectual class as a way to capture the way that that discourse was actively creating um, a, a actively creating that class as a, as a space that brought together both um, sort of, I mean, you had people, I, I kind of grouped in that, that idea of the artistic elite who were coming from um, actual nobility. I mean, uh, Michelski comes through this line of um, actual gentry, um, but also people who uh, were sort of part of that group simply through uh, taking part in the erudite traditions of serious music, creating mm -hmm. musica povazna, serious music. So um, it's for me, it's a loose, uh, an, an intentionally loose category of people uh, almost who, who elect themselves to be part of that class through their, their faith in um, the artist as the one that drives the progress. Yeah, okay. It really, it, it comes down to this idea of, for me about the faith in who's driving the progress. For those who were engaged in um, uh, sort of the Marxist uh, perspective, it was the audience that was the driver of the progress. But for the members of this, I call them the elite intellectual class, they're, they're, they're imagining that 
um, they, they don't want to dismiss the, the audience. They want to reach out to them too, but they want to, uh, um, sorry, they want to connect. Uh, they, they still believe that the artist is necessary at, in order to kind of initiate, get the ball rolling to, to generate that progress. Yeah, where the agency lies, which yes. is, it's, yeah, thank you. So we have um, plenty of time for questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, I think the easiest thing would be to raise your the, the blue virtual hand, which you can find at the bottom of the screen on the uh, under reactions. And that way we I can see clearly who's trying to ask and you can then unmute yourself. Um, or you could of course put comments and questions in the chat, but it, um, I encourage that too, but it also it can become a bit difficult to stay on top of that and listen at the same time. So I think it would be simpler to to do it this way. And um, I, um, is that check mark uh, from Neil Brostoff? Is that a sign yeah. that you? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, Paul, you the first thing um, that you your first comments were at the edge of something that I had in mind uh, that I wanted to ask Lisa and. Um, uh, and any of you, and and it's this. It has to do. I, I'm wondering if there's any um, any parallel uh, between um, between Shostakovich under Stalinism and writing music that was either overtly or covertly Jewish. My my interest area is Jewish art music, um, and the recent in the last five years or so. Um, hard right move in Poland as far as suggestions that, uh, about Polish complicity in the Holocaust and so on. And if there are any composers, either Jewish, well, Poland is a very Juden run country, but I mean, even non-Jewish composers like, um, you know, the, the, the late Penderecki who wrote a number of things which were admirably Jewish or Shostakovich, you know, in, in, in the former Soviet Union, um, and if there's if, if there are any composers who are really challenging, you know, aesthetically, philosophically, politically, any of these strictures, and if any of them have succeeded or are in danger, or what, um, especially what Lisa knows about maybe recent compositions that I don't know about and that I should know about that. Um, uh, that are really edgy as far as political Polish government, Jewish slash Holocaust questions? That's a big question. Um, I think that, uh, as I said, in, in, in the period that I'm writing about, the Holocaust sort of exists as a shadow, sort of, uh, it, it's, it's there, but people aren't talking, uh, the, in the central sort of space of composition, it's not being talked about uh, a lot, but it, it kind of, um, as you said, Penderecki was clearly uh, interested in uh, commemorating the Holocaust. Um, uh, other composers were also, uh, uh, Guretzky famously uh, also kind of uh, in, engaged in the, the trauma of the war and the trauma that was felt uh, uh, especially by the Polish Jewish uh, uh, community. So I, I don't, I don't know quite how to connect this to Shostakovich, uh, uh, it, except that to say that um, hmm, what do I want to say? I mean, I think that that in in the period that I was writing about the 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 trauma of the war was very fresh. It was it had it, and and to engage it head on was very difficult. Um, actually, immediately after the war, you get some pieces dealing with the war, um, and then and then uh, afterwards, there's kind of not not as much because there's a desire to kind of um, I think uh, live and and and. Um, heal. Uh, but in the now, I, I, I don't really know how to answer your question. I think that now um, there are artists who are very politically engaged. Uh, there are artists who are uh, sort of less politically engaged, but I, I, I don't really know how to answer your question about the now. I, there might be art, uh, people here in the audience who would have thoughts about artists now who are engaging the, the legacy of the Holocaust uh, and also engaging with Polish nationalism in the, in the present. Those questions are so fraught in the current moment, given the turn the Polish government has taken on questions of the past and guilt and complicity and so forth. Um, I see Joanna has a hand up, so I'm not sure if it's to comment on that particular question, but go ahead, you, you have the floor. 
Oh, well, okay. I think I speak for a lot of us, Lisa, and wanting to congratulate you on this uh, masterful work. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're all really happy and looking forward to seeing the critical acclaim that will uh, shortly come uh, to your book. Uh, I, I have a very related question to the first one, which is just, it, what is the state of the Polish avant-garde right, right now? And, uh, well, to be provocative, is there a Polish avant-garde now? Well, uh, okay, so actually that does link to the previous question in that um, the, so I would answer this a couple of ways. I, I'd say that the, the, the sounds and styles that were uh, sort of associated with the Polish avant-garde that were, I, I, I talk about this a little bit in my conclusion about how this uh, sort of becomes almost a brand for uh, uh, Polish music as it uh, moves outside of Poland into the broader world. Um, it becomes a kind of um, recognizable series of sounds and styles, um, especially as, say, say Penderecki's music gets picked up in the film industry and um, in some ways becomes the, the best known uh, of the Polish avant-garde. In fact, when I'm telling people about my music and I, my, my book and I say, um, do you know anything about the Polish avant-garde? And they say, no. I say, have you, have, have you ever seen a horror movie in your entire life? And if they say yes, then I say, oh, you've, you've heard uh, Polish avant-garde music or music inspired by Polish avant-garde music, uh, one or the other. Um, so I would say that uh, others have done work on this, uh, of, of what happens after the early 60s, where I kind of end my narrative. Um, and that's that these the younger generations start pushing back against that brand, right? And also even the people that were associated with the brand, if we want to call it that, started going their own uh, uh, ways. So you start seeing uh, Penderecki move towards neo-romanticism neo in the uh, late 70s and the early 80s. Um, Gurecki embraces um, expressivity, uh, uh, not through dr drama, but through um, kind of elegant um, structures. And, and um, he gets kind of lumped in with Arvo Pert that way and kind of uh, creating expressive content through structure. Um, so the, the Polish avant-garde continued on, um, but in some ways the, the construct of it continued doing work that the composers were no longer interested in doing. The composers were doing their own thing, didn't really see themselves as being limited by that, that construct. Um, in the, the, the younger generations coming up really began to uh, critique and push back against uh, the, the idea of this kind of avant-gardeness um, and to go chart lots of different paths. So I would say that experimentalism is definitely happening all, I mean, if, if you go to Warsaw, I, I don't know about right now, when I, the last time I was there, there was new music happening all of the time. Um, I mean, and, and all kinds of experiments with um, timbres and structures. M many people uh, actually feeling very influenced by Bogoslav Schaefer right now, again, like taking him as a, a kind of um, pr provocative uh, leader in, in imagining what the new sounds like. So I'd say that, uh, yes, the, the construct of the Polish school still exists and you're still hearing that sound uh, uh, in a lot of Polish music, but there's also this like vibrant world of new music experimentalism that is doing all kinds of different things. Okay, and um, next is Ro uh, Robert Spich. Robert, I think you're muted. Maybe not. Hmm. Hmm. Pass on. Oh no, I oh. hear you now. Now we hear you. Oh, you hear me? Okay. This is a maybe a naive question here, but um, I think about modernity. Uh, it was people doing their own thing, lots of experimentation. I look at American pop music for example, and they talk about, you know, hip hop, machine music, downtown, hard rock. Uh, and, and I used to always wonder, so what is the difference? What's going on specifically that allows you to say you're not classical, you're not traditional, you're modern? Um, are there specific themes or structures of the music, or structural forms? different keys that they use, unique instruments that they use, uh, joint arts, uh, doing things with poetry, like the program uh, USC had last Saturday, it was, with the woman poet, uh, Ukrainian, and the bass fiddle was, to me, very modern and very interesting. So what are the key characteristics of 
modernity in terms of the operational sides of it? Oh, that's a great question. I, and I think that the real truth is that the answer to that is super um, contextual, right? Like it depends on the on the moment and the context. So um, in my moment and the people I'm talking about, they're, they're uh, uh, attaching modernity to different kinds of uh, uh, musical approaches, musical uh, sounds. Um, initially, I argue that it gets attached to um, dodecophony, the kind of radicalization of, or, or organization of pitches, as opposed to uh, kind of breaking away from traditional harmony and using uh, uh, rows of pitches to structure, uh, structure your piece. That was definitely coming to them through serialism uh, um, in the West. But as, as the composer sort of moved forward, um, new kind of sonic signifiers of Polish modernity came to the fore above those um, sort of uh, harmonic structural uh, organization uh, uh, signifiers and that landed especially around questions of timbre so creating unusual timbres with your instruments or using electronic instruments to create unusual timbres became really important as a signifier of doing something new um, or using texture to um, organize the structure of your composition as opposed to using harmonic uh, movement, for instance, or melodic structures to allow texture to come to the fore as a prime mover was something that was really important for um, uh, Józef Hominski, the, the music theorist and uh, critic that I discuss in my book as kind of uh, theorizing this idea of sonorism uh, or uh, this, this grouping of sounds, uh, uh, timbre, texture, and space and time as a way of organizing and thinking about music. So in that moment, that became the signifier of the new. But I think that modernity in music is often uh, filtered through the idea of breaking away from something and doing something different. Um, and that that breaking away and doing something different can be different depending on where you are and what uh, what you're doing. Uh, that, that sense of rejection and reinvention happens over and over over the course of the uh, 20th century, um, if that answers your question. Great, I think we have time for one more audience question and I see one more hand. So um, Martin, it's um, your turn. Uh, thank you. I don't have any question, but maybe I have an answer to the question about the Jewish heritage in music after the Second World War, because I was thinking about Mieczysław Weinberg, for example, mm. a composer that Lisa, I, I don't think, uh, writes about in, 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 the, in the book, uh, but a composer that is uh, now really important in the uh, how, how to um, think about the avant-garde because he was very close to Shostakovich but also like was really rooted into, into the Jewish uh, tradition but also the Polish identity. So that, that, that would be, I think, the, a great example. Thanks, Marcin. Uh, uh, that's a great example, and, and I would point to uh, Dan Elphick's new book on uh, uh, Weinberg, and um, also uh, Mackenzie Pierce is doing some really interesting work on uh, Jewish composers working in Poland. Um, uh, so it, it, there, there's people doing uh, really great work uh, about that question, um, but definitely in Poland after after the war, there was sort of discomfort uh, with with um, it was just very close, I think. Um, so I, I wonder if um, either of our, our two special guests, Joy or Peter, would like to have a um, chance for a final comment or, or question before we start to wind down. Sure, I can jump in. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot over the course of this discussion and as I was reading the book about how um, I like the move you make in your very first sentence, where you talk about this is a book about Polish music uh, culture during the Cold War, but it's not a book about the Cold War. And, and I like that rhetorical move because it allows you to focus on Poland and evade and avoid some of these problems of influence, right? That's, this is something I'm, I'm wrestling with a lot is how do you talk about music that is imitating other music without making that seem derivative, right? And giving those artists their own creative um, agency and their own creative um, ability to make choices. And, and I think you do, it's not really a question, I suppose. I think you do a very good job of, of, of dealing with that issue, um, acknowledging that these composers were 
in fact, borrowing from other composers as everyone does. And I think there's that letter from Ludoswowski, right, where he is that where he talks about the idea of influence. And I found that to be a really helpful way of articulating some of the things that, that I've been wrestling with. So I just wanted to, to call attention to that, this idea of, of the local versus the global. And then also this idea of finding the national in the avant-garde, because that's often a challenging thing to do with a, an artistic um, method or approach that is so often trying to avoid the national right or avoid traces of being identifiable at all so that I, I found that to be another interesting thread thank you yeah that that letter that Ludoswowski uh I, I I will say that I could not believe when I found that that file folder of materials uh, about this um I, I talk about this at the end of the book this uh sort of case plagiarism case uh, raised by Bogoslav Schaefer against uh uh uh, Guretsky and Baird, uh, accusing them of, of using his notational innovations because, and, and when I took a step back and really thought about what that meant, it indicated that he was really seeing innovation as the driver, uh, as being the most important thing. But for um, Guretsky and Baird and also then Ludoswowski in this letter, uh, innovation is not the most important thing. What's most important is this co conversation and communication and um, kind of building this reciprocal, there's so much reciprocal uh, uh, circular kind of I don't mean circular is not a good word for it, but but uh, uh, movement of of meaning and uh, communication that uh, Ludoswowski really embraces in that letter where he says, um, I I love it when people imitate me because it means that um, I am doing good work for them and that also we're in a conversation. He's imagining it as something that is ongoing. So um, I I that that letter was like gold when I found it. <laughs> We love when those things happen, right? That's, yeah, yeah. This is, the other thing I wanted to point out was how useful uh, your thinking is about generational cohorts, about how that really affects people's experiences going forward. It is very, very much connected to their age group and exactly where how old they were at, at any given point in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And it's just, I think it can be easy for, um, for people to just think, oh, it's the Cold War, it's the 60s, it's, you know, whatever. And in fact, it's it can be very different depending on, you know, what decade a person is in in their lifetime. So thank you for, for foregrounding that too. I thought that was really useful. I have to say that uh, I was so influenced by both of your work, Joy and Peter. Um, Peter, your work with the uh, unofficial avant-garde in the Soviet Union really also challenged me to think about avant-gardism and to re really think about what it was the avant-garde was doing, what the concept of the avant-garde was doing in Poland and Joy, your work with uh, uh, Schoenberg's A Survivor from Warsaw also made me think about, I mean, that's a piece that is also sort of curiously um, focused on um, uh, uh, telling a story, like communicating with audiences uh, for a composer that was felt to be like famously prickly and resistant to um, communication, that piece. And because of that, um, it's a piece that sort of sits difficult in a difficult way in our narratives about uh, music history of the 20th century. Um, I feel the same way about Szymanowski. His music also fits in a, a, a complicated way in um, every so often. In fact, just this summer, there was another article in the paper that was like, why don't, why doesn't anyone know anything about Szymanowski? And it's partly, I think, because his music is doing this this uh, this this work that doesn't fit uh, well within our narratives of the 20th century and, and communicating out. And Szymanowski, um, gave that, uh, I, I'd say, almost as a gift to the generation that followed him, this kind of investment in communication. And that, in some ways, becomes the arc that passes over, the, or that, that continues through the trauma of the war. And you still have people working out what it means to communicate. Um, in fact, as you know, the Survivor from Warsaw was famously performed in Warsaw uh, after the war uh, with sort of complicated uh, reception because of that very thing, this kind of generational conversations about what it means to communicate, what it means to innovate uh, uh, in this post-war moment. I'll, I'll, I think I'll take my um, chair privilege to ask a final question, if that's okay. Um, and I'm, I, I was really struck because this kind of quote unquote backwardness is such a theme in your, in your book. And, and I, I, I like the nuanced way you treat it as, you know, not taking it you know, not just treating backwardness as a real existing thing, but the kind of discourse about backwardness as in a way, a part of the modern, the kind of dialectic of modern, of, of, of being modern or becoming modern. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, I just, because backwardness is so prominent in Russian, in Russian history, going back to the 19th, even 18th century. And, and, and I've, and, and, 
it po pops up in so many other places too. Um, I'm just really curious about kind of how backwardness works in, in the Polish context and you know what kind of what's what the unique valence of backwardness is in late 20 sort of the second half of the 20th century in Poland if you can kind of speak to that in either cultural political or musical terms and sorry that's a, kind of a big final question that is a big final it's, in some ways that's the the, the kind of driving uh, goal of the book is to kind of uh, tease out that question but uh, one of the things that brought me to this topic as I started reading was just seeing the language of backwardness over and over again, language about uh, lagging behind, um, missing things, uh, the sense of needing to catch up with some, some sort of vanishing point out in the future. Um, and it was really important to me um, as I read Maria Todorova's fabulous article about uh, backwardness as it's figured in Eastern in, in uh, narratives about Eastern European nationalism has often been a tool uh, in the in the hands of Western uh, historians to displace their Eastern European subjects into an earlier time uh, space. And so what I wanted to do was really distance myself from, from that, which I think is correct, that that has happened in the history uh, histories that have been told in the 20th century about Eastern Europe, um, and instead to uh, focus on this language as it was being used uh, to generate all kinds of um, agency and, and energy for moving uh, forward, for creating, um, uh, for creating a, a music that would speak to the 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 the, the internal the, the 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 conditions that they they felt were most important and most needing to be addressed culturally and politically and nationally, and um, I think that in Poland it really became linked to the dislocations of the nation in the 19th century and became or the late 18th century the partitions that separated or that erased Poland from the European map, and this. Um, ability to kind of take that experience, that historical experience, experience and live it out in the, collapse it into the uh, present as a metaphor for what was happening again, and then to um, uh, use that sort of energy and anxiety as a way to map, uh, map pathways out of that. Uh, I think that it just became a very kind of creative force for imagining different kinds of paths outwards. So it's really important to me that I uh, be clear that I am not ever the one uh, describing Polish culture as backward, but in fact, I, I'm interested in the way that they are using the word backward to um, open up conversations and to build consensus uh, and agency across, that, that reaches across generational political divides and cultural divides. Thank you so much, Lisa. We are exactly at time. Uh, it is uh, um, been a wonderful pleasure. Thank you so much to Joy and to Peter uh, for joining us, for their wonderful questions, and clearly for being uh, role models, intellectual for uh, Lisa. Thank you, Paul, for your wonderful uh, work, not only as a moderator, but as an interlocutor. And of course, the person we owe the greatest thanks to is Lisa for publishing this book. So I'm going to do something that is not standard in Zoom and ask everyone to unmute themselves so that we can clap sonorously for Lisa and she can hear the enthusiasm uh, that uh, everybody feels about her book. So please unmute yourselves all at once. Can you do that? You're supposed to be able to. Okay. Can you now? Okay. Yay! <laughs>